Well, good evening, and welcome to each one of you. Lovely to see you here, and especially all those who don't normally come. You're here tonight, and we are truly glad. Uh, Mike was saying he hopes you'll go away remembering that we honour Jesus here, but I hope you also go away remembering how good singers we are amongst town. Uh, maybe I should sit in the wings a, bit, a wee bit more often because certainly it sounded very good from where I was. We have something to sing about and we have a wonderful saviour to worship and to praise and to adore. Well, our question tonight is, where am I going? Uh, we were thinking this morning, why am I here? So tonight our question is, where am I going? And of course, we are going to be looking at this from the Word of God. What does the Word of God say as our point of reference? That's what we trust in here, and that's what we want you to hear from. And as we think about eternity, I wonder, do you think about it often? I know I do, even as a Christian. I often think about eternity. Even when I'm not preparing a message that is an evangelistic gospel message, I'm thinking about eternity. Uh, I wonder when you look up at some of those beautiful sunsets that we get, and for those of you who are early risers like me, you get to see some sunrises as well. I wonder, do you think to yourself, I wonder what heaven will be like? Where am I going? Do you know that by the end of today... 151,600 people will have died. It's an important question, isn't it? Where am I going? And the time it takes for this meeting to progress and come to an end, just the time, the duration of this meeting, 6,316 people in our world will have gone. And maybe some of them weren't sure where they were going. Some of them maybe thought they were going nowhere. Some of them maybe thought they were going somewhere. But by the time this meeting ends, 6,316 people will know the answer to the question, where am I going? You know, there's no practice run for death. No dress rehearsal. In life, we can expect to experience a variety of things, and we're able to think about my first experience of this, of that, and of the other, and maybe you can think back, although for some of us, it's getting so far away, we can hardly remember it, our first day at school. Although, mind you, they say the older you get, you remember the things in the past better than you remember what happened yesterday. But that was a first in life, and a big first. First day when we changed school, you went to the bigger school. And so on in education. And your first day in a, in a job environment where you're actually getting paid. And for some of you, the first day of married life. They say the first year's the worst. And then the first day of becoming a parent. That's life changing, isn't it? And then roll on a wee bit, and you have the first day of your retirement. I'm looking in this direction because we have a young lady here who's taken very early retirement just in the last couple of weeks. But maybe, maybe something has happened, and you've had to begin another chapter in your life with a disability. And then there's bereavement. That's the chapter we don't want to think about. But for many, there was a first day. And then there's old age. Hard to know exactly when that starts. Um, Whenever I was in my teens, I thought it started at 30. (laughs) When I got to 30, I realized, oh, it must be 50. So when I get to 50, I'll let you know (laughs) what, what I think the starting ages. But on each of those occasions, you could have actually gone to someone else and you could have said, what was it like for you? Couldn't you? 
You could have asked one of your siblings if you had any in, when you were a child about your first day at school. What's that going to be like? And you could have gone through all of those scenarios and you could have asked somebody, what was that like for you? What was that like for you? But when it comes to death, we can't do that, can we? Because our first will be it. And it's a serious question, isn't it? Where am I going? Benjamin Franklin, the American statesman, famously said in 1789, there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. Now, he may have been right to a point, but here's what I would like to say this evening. There's a vast difference between death and tax. Because I'm sure this wouldn't be true of anybody in this building tonight because you can evade taxation. Uh, you can outwit the tax man on some occasions, but you'll not wriggle out of death. Hebrews 9 from verse 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die. That's an appointment. Now, there's no surprises there. We're not surprised to find that in the Bible. We could have found that in any piece of literature, really, couldn't we? Going to die. But here's what the rest of that verse says, and this is what you won't find in every piece of literature. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, and this is the bit, because where do you go to trust what somebody would say about the after? And we often talk about the afterlife. Where do you go? Because what we read in Hebrews 9 is it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And it's the after this bit I want us to get into your mind. Do you know, if, if you switch off at this point or if another thought comes in and you become distracted, or what, a lot of these things can happen in a meeting. I would love you to take those two words home with you after this. Because do you know in those two words there's enough for God the Holy Spirit to work upon? After this. Well, let's begin about, uh, begin thinking about what was waiting for every single one of us, everyone in this room, when we were born into this world, before we heard of God's offer of salvation, and for most of us, we accepted it. So what was waiting for all of us before conversion? And what was waiting for us all was an eternity. We were talking to the kids this morning about just the immensity of the idea of eternity. We can hardly take that in. An eternal state, a never-ending existence. It's so unlike what we have here. We're constantly marking time. We're constantly looking at schedules, and we're constantly thinking of targets and dates, and, and we're just mastered by time. When you're at school, it's term time, and when you're at work, you're, you're thinking of deadlines and all kinds of things, or even just payday. But to live in a place where there is no time. It's hard for us to take that in. That's what's waiting for all of us, an eternal state. That's a basic principle of the Word of God. And because the Bible teaches that we are all born with our back towards God, now that might come as a surprise to you, but that's what the Bible teaches. We're born with our back toward God. And it's our nature to be like that. And unless we do a complete about turn, and that's really what the meaning of the word repentance is, to do a complete about turn. Because all roads don't lead to God. We are born with our back to God, and we are actually, every day that we live without Him, we are going further and further and further away from Him. And if we harden our hearts to His many calls, and to his precious word and his many opportunities, then not only are we getting further and further away from him, but we're getting further and further towards 
where we're going. Whether we're saved or not, we're going to have to endure an eternal state somewhere. And if we don't turn around and leave the broad road for the narrow, as Jesus clearly taught, then it will be an eternal state away from the presence of God and all hope forever. It will be more specific than that. Jesus said it will be in the place called hell. I'm surprised at how little people know about what the Bible teaches about hell. We have our ideas, we have our notions, and I don't think it's a subject that many people actually take on board in their spare moments to research and to look at. And that is a surprise when you think of the question tonight, where am I going? Just speaking to family members yesterday and they were planning to book a holiday. And the big shock to me is that they're going to be going on the same flight as me to the same resort as me at the same time as me (laughs) in November, God willing. And to make matters worse, a couple of friends of mine revealed the very same thing to me. So there's going to be about six people there. I know I will really have to behave myself. But the research that they did and the, the trip advisor and all the things you do, where am I going? And yet when it comes to eternity, there's this sense in which we just, if we don't think about it, it'll go away. That's one of the most dangerous attitudes, isn't it? And here we are tonight with an opportunity, even just in these few moments, just to spend some time actually thinking, where am I going? Well, I'd like to pick up on something I mentioned this morning. We dealt with the question, why am I here? And I referred to the ideology that's very prevalent today, coming from the stable of atheism and humanism. Many people forget that it takes as much faith to believe in the ideology of humanism and atheism as it takes to believe in the God of the Bible. Because you have to put your trust in those ideologies. You have to believe them. You have to accept that what they're saying is true. And isn't that what we're doing with Jesus? We're accepting that he is true. He is real. So many people forget that you're actually exercising faith in exactly the same way as we are tonight, and yet we come under criticism for blind faith. Well, here's some of the reasons why it's becoming popular today. You see, it suits people. These isms are earth-focused, and we're earthy people. We're from this world. We live here. We've got our feet in the ground, and All we know is what happens from day to day. So these earth-focused belief systems, they suit people. But we know that in both of them, they remove God from the equation completely. There is no God. And because of that, then, of course, there's no accountability to a God. And if there's no God to offend and no accountability to God, then there's no judgment. And if there's no judgment, then there's no need for any retribution in a place such as the biblical hell. Now, that's great if it's true. But you have to believe that it's true. Humanism is slightly more advanced and probably more palatable today than out-and-out atheism. And it has more of an appearance of a religion because it does promote the idea of accountability. But you're not accountable to God. We're accountable to our fellow man. And even more increasingly, we're accountable to the planet that we live on. We must save. That's the language of religion, isn't it? But it's save the planet. Save ourselves. And so on and on it goes. And currently, wokeism is the guiding light 
for human accountability. And it's ever-changing, isn't it? The goalposts are ever-moving. What is morality? However, whether it's atheism or humanism, they have one thing in common. They declare their firm belief that we, ex- we cease to exist at the point of death. And it is a belief. You have to take a step of faith to believe that that is true. But to detract from the hopelessness of that situation, because it really is, this is it. And we talked this morning about the billions of people on the planet and their everyday life is a life of misery and hardship. And the hopelessness of thinking, that's it. So to detract from that, these isms suggest that, well, we can live on in the memories of others and we can, we can continue to influence because of the good that we leave behind, the legacy we leave, and even the very carbon footprint we leave. And on and on and on it goes. What are you believing in? And what is the foundation for what you believe? Where am I going? That is such a serious question. We can't really fool around by trendy isms, can we? Here's really what it boils down to. If the atheist and humanist are right and the Bible believer like me is wrong, well, when it comes to my death and there is nothing, let me ask you a question. What have I lost? I want you to think about that. What have I lost? Because although... There's many things in my life I regret having done. There's many things I wish I had done better, and I could go down through a list. I am all too aware of my own failures, but I still can stand up here today, and I believe I have the best life. Knowing Jesus. It may be hard for you to understand what it is. It's hard for us to describe the reality of a relationship with God and always knowing, although we cannot see that person, we will see him one day as Mike has mentioned. But we know he's there. We know he speaks. He has shown us things that turned out to be the absolute best route to take. And we have this walk with God and our faith and our strength and our faith in him grows from day to day. And we wouldn't change it for anything. So if I were to come to my moment of death, and that's it. What have I lost? I haven't gone and peddled drugs to anybody. I have never coerced anybody to take a spiked drink. I have never dragged anyone off to clubs that got them then into a club life from which they were led into other things. I've never done any of those things. What have I lost? I have tried to be a good neighbor, a good son, brother. Tried to be at least a half-decent pastor. Been with people in all kinds of situations. If I died and there was nothing else, what have I lost? But here's the other side of of the story. What if what we believe is in the Bible is right. What if Hebrews 9 is right? It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. We find the words after this in the book of the Revelation as well, where John is given a vision of things yet to come. And there we find the words after this, and after this, and after this. And there's a catalog of carnage ahead. What if all of that's right? Well, here's the good news. I am in Jesus Christ, and it's well with my soul, and I will be on the winning side 
and I will see him in all his glory. And here's the wonderful thing. I will share in his glory. I will share in his great victory. And that's how it ends. What have I lost? If I'm wrong, nothing. If I'm right, I've gained everything. But what about those who say there is no God? Well, they come out of it with nothing either way. It's a hopeless situation. I wonder are you here tonight and you feel hopeless? Hope's an amazing thing. Hope sustains us through tough times, doesn't it? Hope causes us to have joy when our circumstances say there's, there's nothing in these circumstances that could ever suggest you could be joyful. And yet, because of hope, we can. And it's hope that spurs us on to do things that are beyond our normal ability. And in serving the Lord, many of us have done things that we could never have done before. I wish I could take you back to when I was a spotty-faced Wayne. And I was so shy, it's unbelievable. And I had a big Welsh pastor, and he couldn't get me to do anything. He tried his best. I wouldn't even get up to the front and read a verse out of the Bible. I often wonder, I've lost complete contact with those people. I wonder, did they ever discover that I ended up in the platform? And how is this? Is it because of anything in me? Absolutely not. Naturally, it is not there. It's all of God. You can go on an adventure with God. It's not a case of saying, oh, I want to avoid hell, so I'm going to become a Christian, and I'm going to sit in the drudgery of the do's and don'ts of a miserable Christian existence and push myself out to church and make sure I toe the line and just sit it out until I die, and then, great, I don't go to hell. If you have that impression of Christianity, well, it's maybe a version of Christianity, but it's not a real, living, vital relationship with Jesus, and that's what we have. And that's why we are not afraid to look into the subject of where am I going. We're not afraid to ask ourselves that question in our quiet moments in our own home. Because we have this wonderful assurance that we will see the king one day. Now, the competing belief systems that I've mentioned and the fact that you don't lose out by choosing one, it's not really a gamble like that. Because something happens to us, and I hope it's happening here tonight. I hope it has maybe been happening to somebody. Because God has a wonderful way of getting our attention. Now, you have to be very careful And if you're listening to what I'm about to say here now, and God has been getting your attention, and you have been pushing him aside, you're in very dangerous ground. Because that's exactly how somebody hardens their heart. And it's one of the most damning descriptions in all of the Word of God, is the hardened heart. You see, it's not just all about... Well, I might as well, what have I to lose? It's not all about that. Because the reality is that God speaks. Let me take you back to whenever I first started to take the thoughts of eternity seriously. I had lost an uncle who was young when he died. And then just a short time later, my granny who really spoilt me rotten. So she's responsible for all the bad traits. But she was a great wee woman and faithful uh, saint of God and a praying woman. And she died. And I remember the impact that that had on me with regard to 
where I would spend eternity. So God was speaking. And then I came under a period, what I call conviction of sin. That might be a new term to you, but it, I got no rest or peace. I couldn't think about anything except what would happen if I were to die today? Now, how do you get that into somebody's heart and mind? I wish I could do something or hypnotize you and cause you to. We, we can't do that. That is of God. And God came in a very real way, and I couldn't get a night's sleep for worrying. And the big problem was this. All I could think of was all that I had done wrong. That's all I could think of. The Bible calls that sin. Things that maybe you wouldn't think were sins. But you see, whenever God starts to work in your life, everything comes alive. And I went through that period where I was tortured in my mind, realizing that I was offending God every minute that I breathed. And here's the amazing thing. I would turn up at the gospel meeting. And quite often when I was young, because there was a period when people were getting saved almost every week. I wish we were back at those times. And because of that, preachers had the boldness to have an appeal and they would maybe ask for everyone at the end of the meeting when all eyes are closed to look up or maybe raise their hand and indicate that they wanted to trust Jesus as their saviour. And whenever the Sunday night service would come around, even though I was going through this experience, in those moments, it was the toughest thing to respond and then I would leave the meeting and be tortured all the more. And on and on it would go. You want to know the outcome of that? Well, I'll tell you. There was a mission held by a man from this area at that time. He was living just up the road here at the time that they, he had the mission in my hometown of Balamone. But he was living on the Jordanstown Road. And his name was Sam Workman. And do you know everything Sam said I had already heard? But the Spirit of God was working in the meetings. And they sang a hymn one night, and it was taken from Acts 26. It was, we were singing scripture, but it was new to me. And it was almost persuaded, but lost. And I had an impression, even though I was young, I had an impression that if I didn't come that night, It would be like one of the verses of that hymn said, Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day on the isle call. That's also taken from another scripture. And that's what hit me. How can I play around with God? I hope there's nobody here tonight and you're playing around with the God who wants to save you. The God who allowed his son to be beaten, spat upon, lashed, falsely accused, mocked, scorned, nailed, crucified, suffocated on a cross for you. Jesus gave a parable. It may even actually be a story, but we know it as a parable, and it's found in Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. I want you to listen to these words because I would like Jesus to be the preacher here tonight. And this was Jesus' message. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. That was the status symbol. And he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. 
and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's an old term, Jewish term for paradise. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, that's the rich man, being in torments. And seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus, he cried out and said, Father, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. And this is Jesus who's lifting the curtain here. It's not me. It's not Luke, the writer of this gospel. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abram said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest good things, including opportunities. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then the rich man said, I pray thee, or I ask thee, Father, that thou would send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. That's an old way of saying they have the scriptures. Let them hear them. And the rich man said, No, Father, but if one went from the dead, if, in other words, if somebody rose from the dead, they would believe and repent. And Abram persisted with his answer. He said, If they hear not the Scriptures, how will they believe if one rose from the dead? What's Jesus saying there? He's saying... These two men had experienced the after this. They'd got the answer to where am I going? And there was a massive difference between the two. There was a difference between the two characters in life. One had all the advantages and one had none. The rich man in the story goes unnamed, but he was a man of property, of status. He wore purple. That was a sign of his standing in the his society. He had an abundance because he was able to eat really well every day, not just a Sunday roast. But he was also a man of self-indulgence. Whereas the beggar, we do get his name. And he has no means of support. He doesn't even have bandages for his wounds. He has no roof over his head He's grateful for crumbs. What a difference. There was a difference in life. There was a difference in death. The rich man dies and is buried. That's, that's all we read, but we can assume that the whole of the community would want to know about it. There would probably be a big send-off for him and his five brothers, and they will attend the service, no doubt. But when it comes to the beggar, we realize that the angels were looking out for him. No doubt on the earth there was no funeral. He was possibly just disposed of as beggars may have been. There would have been no obituary, no eulogy. But the angels knew. And therefore, there was a difference, not only in life and in death, but in the after this. And this is the main point of the story. This is what Jesus wants us to see if we see nothing else. The great difference in eternity. 
One is comforted and one is tormented. That's it, repeated, it's simple, but it's a fact. What a difference. There's a great distance between the great gulf fixed as a way of emphasizing just the vastness of the difference between the state of one and the state of the other. How did the rich man end up in the place called hell? Is there some sin that we can identify in this passage? I believe the answer lies in the part of the conversation where the five brothers are mentioned. Because we can see this family's attitude to the word of God. And it's through the word of God that God most normally speaks. Now I know God can speak in a variety of ways and we've mentioned some of them earlier on in my life, bereavement and so on. But the normal way is through his word. And God obviously had been speaking through his word, but this man had been ignoring the voice of God. How can we ignore the voice of God and then expect to stand one day on the threshold of eternity and think that he let us in? What part of the word of God are you ignoring? Or you're maybe happy with the love thy neighbor, but you're maybe happy with that I shall not covet or I shall not kill or steal. You may even go as far as I won't take the Lord's name in vain. Very good. But what about Jesus' words? You must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus used the word torment four times in that story. He doesn't want you to go through it. He went through torment on Calvary. He's been there. He's absorbed all of my eternal torment when he died on the cross so that I might never face it again. But I had to put my complete trust in that what he did on the cross, he did for me, and he did. He absorbed my judgment. The sin that should have weighed me down and pushed me into a lost eternity, he took it. He removed it. And when I trusted him as Savior, those sins were gone, and they're still gone. And it's only because of what Jesus did. That I know where I'm going. That a way has been opened up. Jesus says, I am the way. No man comes to the Father except through me. Where am I going? I mentioned earlier about gambling with two options. It's not a gamble. And I'll tell you why. You see, after I trusted the Lord as my Savior, I then had the assurance of salvation. For some, it mightn't come immediately, and they may have to get into God's Word and discover all the wonderful scriptures where even where John keeps saying over and over again, we know, we know, we know. And it resonates. But there are many other ways. For example, for some in this place, you see the first day they got an assurance of salvation was the first day they told somebody they were saved. And you know what happened? They were flooded with an assurance. It's hard to describe. And that has never, ever left them. Is this all fairy tales? Maybe you think it is. But for many in this room tonight, it's real. And it's because it's real to us, we want you to come into the good of it as well. We want you to experience it. We want you to know it. We want you to have this assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. 
heir of salvation. Purchase of blood. Purchase of God, born of a spirit washed in his blood. That's my story. Is it yours? Where am I going? If God is speaking to you tonight and you do feel that you've been under conviction, you've been challenged, you think also as I did that this could be your last opportunity, don't leave this place this evening without speaking to us. There will be a time of fellowship around a cup of tea, plenty of opportunity. And you can leave here tonight knowing you're going to be with Jesus when this old life is over. We're going to sing again, and it's another question. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, and we'll stand as we sing. Father, we are glad tonight that Jesus shed his blood that we might live. We're glad we're covered. We're glad we're washed. Oh, for any tonight who are in the valley of decision, oh, give deciding grace, we pray. 
that we might all rejoice together after this. Lord, we all want to be together after this life. Lord, may it be so that not one person in this room this evening will be missing when the role is called in heaven. So bless our fellowship together, hallow our time, and bless the good things provided to our use. And at the end of our time, Take us safely to your homes and speak on when the preacher's voice is silent. And to you will be all the glory. Amen.